Rust is a systems programming language that uh, runs blazingly fast, prevents almost all crashes and eliminates data races. So th this is the promise of Rust. And we, uh, we're going to get a better understanding of how, how that is accomplished. Uh, Kalevi, I think you muted yourself again. Okay, sorry. Uh, I have a mute button, <laughs> which I seem to be leaning into. Um, so the point one release uh, came out in January 2012, and uh, the 1.0 stable release uh, was released in uh, May 2015, so five years ago. The significance of the 1.0 release is that uh, it provides backward compatibility uh, guarantees that you can take code written five years ago and you can compile it still with the latest compiler. Today we are at the release 1.44, but um, that's just a matter of new features having added to the language. Kalevi, your mute button. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's causing uh, me to be muted all the time. Is it someone um, muting all? Um, okay, let's try and stick with this. So, Rust in Embedded. Um, uh, so, Rust language is an LLVM front end. And I'm, uh, this is kind of related to the Rust compiler part of it, but it's what enables Rust to be easily added to embedded systems. Uh, I have a second slide which is trying to illustrate this intermediate representation better. But um, before we get into that, the platform support, uh, the tier one platforms are Linux. Windows 7 and OS X. And I pulled in here a couple of the, what Rust calls tier two supported platforms. Uh, many of our customers also use Cortex-M, which is typical small embedded system. And there, uh, the various Cortex-M families supported. However, I'd like to note that it says bear in front of them. So the R toss is related to uh, what you often run on them are not supported, so you can do bare metal easily. And there's a link at the bottom of the page to understand better this platform support. But um, on the next slide, I will better try and open up this intermediate language. So LLVM is a compiler infrastructure. Um, Apple for a long time uh, said forwarded this mission. So uh, Clang, C++, Objective-C are kind of first class citizens of, of LLVM front ends. And examples I have also added here that there's a Fortran front end, and Haskell front end. So, and, and obviously there's a Rust front end. So the, the front end's responsibility is uh, to create this intermediate language where the LLVM optimizer then passes that, uh, think of it as a middle layer, to the target compiler, which you can see on the right, whether it would be an x86, PowerPC, or an ARM um, backend for LLVM. So for example, the, the ARM compiler 6 is an LLVM backend. So you can use it to create the target binary and you could have a Rust um, front end. Uh, so a couple of words on the LLVM optimizer, even though it's not so tied to the Rust language, is that it, it kind of creates, um, 
if you will, a Java bytecode type of um, intermediate language, which then gets passed on to the, <clears throat> the back end. And um, it enables um, just in time running and things like that, but uh, Rust as a starting point is a compiled, ahead of time compiled language. So here are some of the promises of Rust. Guaranteed memory safety, threads without data races, zero cost uh, abstractions, rate-based generics, pattern matching type inference, and, and there are more features, but um, most of this I'm going to cover here in this presentation with uh, short code examples. So the, the Rust goal, um, so Rust is trying to cover and provide both control and safety. So on the right hand side, you'd see typically scripting interpreted languages such as Python, where the language and the environment kind of prevents you from getting into the, uh, getting yourself into trouble. And on the left hand side, there's examples of C and C++ where you have absolute control of what your code is doing and how it's executed. And then Java supposedly is in the middle there, but Rust is trying to cover this whole ground. And so as I mentioned on the previous slide, Rust is a ahead of time compiled language. So it's not attempting to try and <clears throat> run time check or have a virtual machine scheme or something like that to accomplish this goal. But we'll get more understanding of how that's accomplished. Here are a few companies that are um, using Rust. I mean, they're not completely you're doing everything in Rust, but uh, are big companies such as Dropbox and uh, Coursera and MPM being an open source project. Canonical also uses Rust. Um, so these, these are the some of the bigger names and you can find more in the link on the slide. But the thing that really got this um, Rust started was um, the need to create a more uh, safe uh, web browser engine. So the uh, Mozilla Firefox uh, Servo is written in Rust to overcome some of their challenges where it was previously written in C++. But there's a whole list of apps that have been created in Rust, uh, which you can find in the in the GitHub link that I'm listing, just to understand more what all has been done with it. And even though this is not, not core to the, the language here, I just want to mention, because you're going to see it on the next slides where we have code examples, that there's a, a project tool that does a number of things. and um, instead of me running the Rust compiler and then executing the binary, I'm running this cargo tool, which compiles and runs the code that I'm going to be showing. But I'm just mentioning it here for completeness. So now, now we're off to looking at code. I've picked a lot of simple code so that um, this is easy to follow. Uh, the last code that I show will be a little bit more indicative of, of the learning curve, but the uh, intention here is just to show things that are easy and familiar looking, even if you're coming from what, whatever programming language. So on the syntax here, the fn stands for function, and we have a main function as an entry point, and the print ln with an exclamation mark also looks easy to understand. The exclamation mark means it's a macro, uh, but other than that, this should be simple to digest. So the bottom of the screen, we're running car saying cargo run, which then uh, compiles and runs the, the executable, which is now printing out hello world. So this is to get us going and <clears throat> 
And I'm listing here some primitive types, and this is kind of self-evident that every language would have them, but I'm trying to allow you to have a better, easier way of reading the code to follow. So there's uh, floating point types, unsigned and signed integers, uh, cars and a string reference. And um, you don't necessarily have to assign these types, but you can. And here's some more in a main function where we're assigning an integer one for um, x. Then we have a type inference for y, where it's two i. And there's a variable declaration, array literals, string literal, which is more obvious than the one on the previous page. And we're printing all of this out and using the cargo run at the bottom where we're saying, what's going to come out. So the, the print line there is uh, in, in order inserting the variables where you see the curly braces in, in the quotation marks for the print LN. Um, familiar from other languages. So now we're getting into what makes um, Rust different. So we have a concept called variable mutability. And here we're assigning uh, the variable x, an integer one, and then we're going to try and reassign it a 10, and then we have the print line. So the compiler is saying, this is not good. You have an immutable variable x, you can't reassign it. So the thing is that we add a let mut for mutable for x, and uh, we get past that error. Now, the compiler is, is not still happy because now we're saying we have a mutable variable, but uh, we're never going to read it. We're just going to reassign the, the x10, and, and, and Rust doesn't like this. So this is to give you a flavor of, of what's to come. Rust is really about, um, say uh, static code analysis <laughs> where uh, you cannot compile the code if the, if the compiler doesn't like what you're doing. So, so that's where the, the kind of big promises come from that you are just unable to compile code until you get everything correct. So moving forward, we, <clears throat> We have another example here of, um, kind of getting into the mood where we are allocating um, Y on the stack and on the heap we're allocating a, a box object, looks very C++ style. Um, and, and this example works, we do the cargo run and um, we get what we expect. This is just to prime us for the next slide. Uh, we are able to mutate the heap. This is fine. This is okay. It's the primitive values that we, we need to be um, aware of when we want to mutate them. So, and this code works and um, compiles and runs, as you can see from the cargo run. Um, the, the message here is that the compiler inserts kind of a freeing of the X after the variable goes out of scope. So as mentioned, there is no garbage collection. So the compiler has to observe when the variables go out of scope and, and, and he allocates them. Uh, so th this is one of the nice things about Rust that um, if you follow the rules, then the compiler handles the deallocation. So borrowing, borrowing is an important concept related to um, the concurrency and, and threads aspects and the safety related to it. 
So here we're assigning max the value of five and um, then you can borrow the x as you can see the let y equals um, reference to x and, and z the same way and a function can borrow x and uh, another you can um, this is all acceptable and this is all okay so <clears throat> what, what is not okay is that you can only have one uh, mutable borrow so as you can see the, the compiler will say that the uh, let z equals uh, mutable x is not fine because we already assigned y to be um, y to borrow um, so key, key concept here uh, simple example but um, these are the things to part of the learning curve on, on how to get up to speed on Rust. So, so it's possible to transfer ownership. In, in this example now we have first time we have a main function and then we have another function called add, add one. And um, in the syntax, you're, um, you're seeing what type it's going to return. So it's going to return uh, box I32. And uh, it's going to increment the num uh, variable, no, not variable, but um, type. And, uh, and then the last line here in the fn function, add one, it says num, and it looks like a, a typo because there's no semicolon at the end. But this is actually a Rust way of uh, returning. So instead of saying in other languages, return num semicolon, just having num without the semicolon is the whole return. Can argue whether this is necessary or not, but that's the way it is. Um, so the, the main function is going to create them a box object and then the y is going to be uh, calling add one uh, with that box object and and it's going to increment it and this works as expected so an example of where we can uh, transfer the ownership And, and this is pretty much the same um, as the previous slide, except here we're not using y uh, at all. We're kind of assigning x to be reassigned with the add one function. Um, seems kind of self-evident that this is allowed, but a lot of things in Rust that are not <laughs> allowed to ensure safety. Um, so this is example of transferring back. So I'm going to run through some other Rust features um, just to give you a feel of um, it is a modern language and some of the time things are actually nice and convenient because I've concentrated on <clears throat> all the things that ensure the safety and there's obviously things that make the language also very expressive and modern I'd say. So pattern matching is so the match keyword where this would normally look like a case statement in some languages and and if we run this it would print five and and then there's an underscore at the end that catches everything else this seems like self-evident that the language would have this type of uh, well not not self-evident but uh, easy to accomplish in any language so here's a matching where <clears throat> The matching criteria can be an or, the one or two, can be an exact one where it's print three, and you can have a range from four to seven, and then we have the catch anything with the underscore. So that this, I think, makes things in many occasions um, more compact to, to do some of the matching. 
So here's a here's a matching example where uh, we have a struct from in which we are going to pull out the x value of that uh, uh, struct point, and and it's done through this matching. So the print line is going to print out uh, zero, but uh, it's really just getting out the the point value x. So it doesn't need to be this long list that you are going through with the matching uh, examples earlier. So closures, so we're assigning add one um, function we saw on the previous uh, slides. And, and this can be thought of like a lambda type of scheme where we're getting a lot of things done on, uh, on a single line. Uh, so the, the curly braces one plus x is the closure mechanism. But um, I don't think this is um, that significant except you just know how to expect that this is possible. You can read other people's code when you're learning that um, this is what's happening. There, there are other closure examples which um, are quite powerful but um, would require longer examples. <clears throat> so traits. Um, traits is trying to take the C++ multiple inheritance and and not allow you to do multiple inheritance of um, both of class members and, and variables. So so we have here on the screen a circle, <clears throat> and then we have a trait has area where it's saying it has a function area. So a trait will not have um, implementation. It's kind of a pure interface or how you want to think about it. Uh, I forget now which language this concept originally came up with uh, from, but uh, this is not like a mix-in where some languages uh, have this mix-in concept where there's implementation also can be inherited. So then we have the, the IMPL impl has area for circle. We're actually implementing this um, uh, the functionality. In the main function we're calling uh, C area, and I, I noticed there's a typo. We're not we're not calculating the radius. We're calculating the area uh, which is being returned by uh, by the has area. But um, this is just to say that um, uh, the C++ multiple in inheritance is being avoided through this mechanism that making it a less sharp object. I don't think multiple inheritance in itself is bad, but it's possible to create bad things. So we're getting to the last example of um, code. And this is the simplest example I could find to give you a little bit of understanding of how thread safety is um, being accomplished. And while I think this is super difficult, I'd say we we have some more concepts here to understand besides the closures. So we were allocating a mutable uh, data type uh, vector and, and it's VEC with the exclamation mark. So it's a macro. So these are being initialized. And um, the thing we haven't talked about in the past is also there are this use <clears throat> of uh, import include type of st statements from other languages where we, we need to actually say what we're getting the implementation from, which had been omitted from the previous slides. 
So in the main function, we're going to iterate from zero to three. We are going to create a thread and thread spawn. Now this move keyword here is, is significant. It, it, um, it will convert uh, any variables captured and uh, by reference to, to mutable references and, and kind of trying to solve the problem of um, how you don't want these data races. However, this is an example of what will not work. So uh, in the for loop, we are reading the, the first um, item of the vector and we want to increment it uh, with i. And uh, Rust will not allow this to, to, to compile because of the, the error message, you can see the mood value data. So probably not the example where you're going to say, hey, I understand this, but uh, there's this, this concepts of borrowing and ownership, uh, which are the ways uh, that Rust is trying to accomplish the, the thread safety. And um, yeah, this, this is really a, the simplest example I could pull to to give you some intuition on the topic. So last part of code, if you're still with me, great. Um, I think we're doing this webinar, so you don't know if people are falling asleep or not. So this is the slide from the beginning. I'm just recapturing here. Uh, guaranteed memory safety, threads without data races, zero cost abstractions, because they are done at compile time. So the compiler is really, really slow. Uh, even for simple code, it takes forever to compile. And as I mentioned, it's kind of a static code analysis bundle in the compiler front end, <clears throat> which allows this Rust promises to exist. So there was an example of the trade based generics pattern matching. I didn't have anything on the type inference, but uh, you should have now a general feel of, of uh, what Rust may be. Uh, and just a recap here of the uh, LLVM language thing that uh, you could, um, you could say it's always risky to start using some new language, but um, you really may not be changing your compiler backend. So this is the thing to be aware of that, say the jump to trying Rust out should not be uh, as significant if you're already using a LLVM compiler. And here are some um, four generic things about how to get started. So obviously you need to add cargo to your build environment. You could start off by building a really small application related to your product or, or maybe just creating a library. Obvious things to say, but uh, you, you don't need to port or, or go crazy. Uh, if you want to get started with this, small applications will get you quickly going. So I wanted to mention here about, um, we had a lot of people sign up for this uh, webinar and, and no surprise that Rust is the, the most loved language in this uh, yearly stack overflow questionnaires and I have been several years in a row. This is the 2019 figure. Uh, Rust 83.5% uh, saying they, like the language and I'd say the interesting comment I heard from uh, from a talk by one of the Mozilla engineers that um, it, it's easy to love Rust if you're kind of doing your own project and you pick the tool and you work on it and the true true test for Rust is if someone were to force you to use it would you still love it so take this love thing here with a grain of salt but 
I, I have to say I, I really enjoy the many aspects of Rust. Here are some links to get you started. Installation is really simple on the systems that have bash or even sub Windows subsystems for Linux. There's a great book uh, available for free on the web. You can immediately go and try Rust in your browser with play.rustlang.org. And then I'd like to highlight that these Rust examples are, are really key for, for learning Rust, reading through those. And uh, thank you. And now I'm going to take the first look at the, the questions. So if you have questions, please shoot them in the chat. Sorry about the audio things in the beginning. Uh, I don't have an explanation to what was happening there. Okay, sound, sound related. Yeah, sorry about the sound issues. Um, okay, Oscar asks, is compiler times an issue? I mean, <clears throat> I mean, they're they're not. Um, if you're used to like compiling a simple thing with GCC, it, it's not an issue, but uh, it's where the compiler does a lot of checks and it's it's been optimized quite a bit here over the years. So it, it used to be even worse. So Reza is asking, are there any prepared libraries for ARM development chains in Rust? Um, so what I've seen is that, that there's various things on GitHub where people are trying things out uh, for let's say ARM Cortex M but uh, in general, ARM binaries are ARM. Um, ARM is being in the the various ARM architectures are in the tier two section. So please take a little look at that. So for large projects, um, um, I don't think it's it's that huge of a problem if you understand that what you're getting is is the static code analysis benefits. Uh, from the compiler. If, if you're comparing it to your existing things, then then uh, you you might see it as a problem. Um, so there's a question: Would Rust be good for new projects? Mm, yeah, why not? I mean, it, it's a systems language, so it doesn't require anything, any other support infrastructure. So you can create an operating system from scratch. And there is a Rust operating system created by someone. Um, so the, then there's a question from Hannes about um, debugging on embedded devices. Um, I'd say it's it's very similar, to, or it's it's the same as debugging with um, to a certain point, but. Um, Obviously, the understanding of um, C++, if you're, let's say, embedding uh, embedded system is uh, uh, if you're debugging C++ in embedded systems, you're also kind of losing some of the C++ information is not all available to uh, the debug info. So, um, I don't really have a good answer to that, but obviously the existing languages are stronger, but it, it all depends on how you define debugging. For example, if you want to just see the, the trace of what is being executed, that's not tied to the programming language. Um, that's just the trace port. Okay, so we have another question of when Changing code in a project with several files and only changing the subset of files. We Rust compile all files again, or only those changed. There is a incremental 
system. So it, it doesn't build everything from scratch. So there are these type of optimizations part of the, the compiler, but I'd still just say it's slow, <laughs> but it, it's kind of intentional to be slow because doing a lot of checks, it, it doesn't come for free. Um, I'm scrolling back if I missed any other versions. Got a question. Um, okay, we have. So we have a question from Reza. Uh, can we use Lauterbach trace and debug with Rust plug and play or need to rewrite everything? So for the Lauterbach trace part, uh, it's language agnostic. So you, you are able to see the trace exactly as you would see it on other systems. And, and as mentioned before or in the presentation that um, the back, uh, back end of LLVM is the one that generates the code. So the, the rustness there doesn't really <clears throat> change things. Uh, and, and for general type of debugging, it's a matter of having the symbol file that allows you to do. Now here, if we define debug is as kind of stop and go JTAG debugging, then it's a matter of having the symbol file and the sources, but um, Lauterbach will not understand Rust um, uh, source code as it will for C, C++. Uh, is Rust allowed in functional safety? Oh, this is not really a topic I'm, I mean, I'm familiar with functional safety, but um, it, it probably, depending on your level and standards, it's a combination of what type of testing you have in your system, what type of static code analysis you would have on top of probably Rust, and then, um, in other aspects, but uh, I don't think the basic st starting point um, um, from a compiled language po point of view, there should be, but there's always the details and, and what kind of functional safety you're aiming for that um, comes into the mix with, with this question. Um, if you, maybe if I just change the question to just general safety, you know, I'd say Rust is highly recommended from a uh, reducing your attack surface type of um, thinking, but functional safety is a very specific topic. Any more questions coming in? Oh, well, thanks Oscar. Good. Um, thank you all for joining. Thank you for the questions. Um, sorry for the audio glitch in the beginning, um, me being on mute. And yeah, people, there's no, no new. Uh, th thank you for the feedback here that is coming in in the chat window. Great, great. Uh, People seem to still be awake since you're putting in this thank you. So great to have you here on the webinar. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you for joining.